Amen. All right, students. Anyone else had a rough week? Yes. Yes. My, my nose. It will not stop. Same? Thank you. Thank you. I know there's a couple other you also. Same. Oh, man. It's been rough. It's been rough. All right, y'all. Hey, just to uh, pre- be, be prepared, as Scar would say, um, go ahead and get your Bibles, please. Open up to the book of Acts. I mentioned last week that that is the book that we're going to be in for the entire semester. Um, so please open up to the book of Acts. It is the fifth book in the New Testament. If you do not have a Bible with you, they are in the back, not on the round tables as usual. They are in the buckets that Corey is standing in front of. She's raising her hand. If you need a Bible, look at that. If you need one, they are over there. If you have one on your phone, fantastic. If you have one, a physical copy of God's word, fantastic. The book of Acts chapter one. Uh, As you are turning there, um, I got a a little bit of a a story for you guys. Um, So if you know anything about me, um, I am a dad. I have three kids. Uh, If you have met them, uh, thank you. If you've met them, I uh, consider yourself very lucky, but I also want to apologize for anything that may have happened with them, um, especially dealing with one of the boys. Um, That said, I have three of them, so therefore someone's in the middle. Her name is Story. My daughter Story is in the middle. She is adorable. She is amazing. She is magnificent. Uh, If you have interacted with her, uh, there is something special about her. Um, But the cool thing about children... um, is they have this innate sense of independence while being ridiculously dependent at the same time. Does that make sense? Like they so much want to be their own person, which they are, and do everything on their own and be able to complete every task by themselves, but they can do almost nothing on their own and need help with everything. Uh, Take take Story for instance. Uh, She is probably the most independent of my three children. Uh, My oldest, Jax, would not be happy with me saying that. But Story is probably the most capable. She beat Jax in an arm wrestling contest uh, last week. (laughs) Um, But yeah, Story is probably the most capable. And I think she kind of knows that, but she's pretty humble. She won't admit it. Um, But so she likes to do tasks on her own. Um, Kate will give her laundry and be like, hey, here's your clothes. You know, go in your room, take care of them. Here's the sheets for your bed. Go Go in your room and make your bed after you folded your clothes. And so Story will you know, go off down the hallway into her room and start um, folding her clothes. Um, many times we found that she just shoves them in drawers, but, you know, not every time. So anyway, she's, she's there folding her clothes. Uh, several minutes go by, she's done folding her clothes, and then we hear these little uh, grunts coming from her room um, as she is, um, please, anyone hate the fitted sheet on the bed? Oh, yes, I heard the groans, the fitted sheet. I am 31 years old and I hate the fitted sheet. So I can only imagine how much my seven-year-old hates the fitted sheet. So she's done putting away her clothes. She started on the sheets and then we hear these little grunts coming from her room. Uh, And and the grunts are are small and quiet at first, uh, but then they begin to increase in velocity and um, proximity to one another and become more constant and more consistent. And the little groans then turn into uh, little, little cries of frustration as she's sitting there trying to put the fitted sheet on her bed. Uh, and this happens many times, many times. Um, so we go to her and we're like, hey, Story, what's going on? And usually it's something with, I'm, I'm trying to fill in the blank and I can't do it. And then we're like, okay, you know, have, have you tried doing it? Uh, obviously knowing she has, but just wanting her to, hey, you know, process through this. Yes, I have. It's like, okay, like how, how long did you try? Did you try for like four seconds or did you try for a little longer than that? She's like, I, I tried. How, did you try everything you could? Yes. I said, okay, did you ask for help? That's usually when her, her voice softens a little bit and it's a little quieter. Maybe her head drops a little lower. And, no. And so we are often like that as well. We have this idea that we are super independent Uh, when actually we are very dependent, very needy, um, very hinged people, um, and we need help with them. And so as we pick up in Acts chapter 1 tonight, we're going to be going through the first 
<clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be going through the first 11 verses. Uh, as we do this, I want to, we're going to split it into kind of two sections, verses 1 through 5, and then verses 6 through 11. I want to walk through this together. As I read this, I'm going to be kind of explaining a few things, trying to help us all understand as we go through the book of Acts together, what's going on, why this book was written, what kind of the backstory is, just kind of give us a, a big picture of what we are getting ourselves into uh, and then I have like a, an application for it at the end. Uh, I will tell you up front, verse 8 is kind of the, the crux of this passage. But let's go ahead and start with the first five verses. Um, if you've ever heard someone speak and, and they read and they explain things as they read and you're like, oh my gosh, shut up. Like just, just read the whole thing and explain it afterwards. I'm sorry, I'm about to do that. Uh, so bear with me. <clears throat> so in the beginning, it says, in the first book, so that's where I'm going to stop right there. So clearly, uh, this is the second book that has been written. So the book of Acts was written by a guy named Luke. He was a physician. He was a doctor. Um, he writ, as far as content-wise, the majority, uh, he wrote more of the New Testament than any other author did. It's just two books, because those two books of his are very long um, but so his first book was the gospel according to Luke. There are four different gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke wrote the, first, Luke wrote, um, the gospel according to Luke. And then this, the book of Acts, just kind of picks up right where Luke leaves off. So in the first book, O Theophilus. So he is writing this to an individual. We see in the beginning of Luke, if you want to flip back there, you're most welcome to, the first um, passage uh, in chapter 1 of Luke. Luke writes to Theophilus, and it, it seems like Theophilus has asked Luke to write an orderly account of things that have happened in Jesus' life. He's like, hey, Luke, bro, can you do me a favor? Can you, like, take account of everything that happens with Jesus and then get back to me on it? And Luke's like, cool, I got you, 100 bucks, give it to me later, 100 now, 100 when I complete the thing, we're good to go. Uh, anyway, and so he's writing an orderly account of the things that happened in Jesus' life in the Gospel of Luke. And then here in the book of Acts, he's giving an orderly account of the things that happened once Jesus ascended. We'll go over that here in just a second. And then the beginnings of the church. Now, when I say church, I don't just mean this building that we're in, because yes, this is a church building. But whenever a church is mentioned um, in, sorry, I lost my train of thought. A church is the body of believers. It is not just a building. So we in here, any one of us, any group of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ together, collectively, we are the church. And so the book of Acts is an orderly account of the beginnings of the church. <clears throat> in the first book, still in verse 1 here. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, very big deal, very important. Uh, Going to get into it a lot more next week. Uh, through the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Okay, so... Here, Luke is just introducing this second volume to Theophilus. He's like, hey, in the first book, you know, this is what I wrote to you. You know, it took place from, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry up until he ascended into heaven. Um, you remember towards the end of the gospel accounts, Jesus was crucified. And then three days later, he was resurrected by the power of God. Whoa, that's so cool. Thank you, man. Okay, cool. Uh, but anyway, what's really cool, uh, later in the New Testament, I believe it's in uh, one of Paul's writings, um, he talks about how Jesus appeared to over 500 people after he was resurrected. Uh, the, there's many skeptics who say, hey, the resurrection didn't happen, um, but there's a lot and a lot of lot of evidence to say, yes, the resurrection did in fact happen. Anyway, moving on, verse 4. Um, this is kind of picking up here with, with what's happening with Jesus and the disciples. And while staying with them, that is Jesus with them, he ordered them, Jesus ordered them, not to depart from Jerusalem. So they're there, they're in Jerusalem. Jesus is like, hey, don't go anywhere. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
So Jesus is resurrected. He's seen by hundreds of people after he's been crucified, now back alive, seen by hundreds of people. He's with his disciples in Jerusalem. Uh, he, they already know, like, hey, they, they have a mission to do. Shortly before this, Jesus had given them the great commission. You can find that in Matthew 28. It's like, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they know that they have a mission. They have something to do. Jesus has commanded them. Jesus has had say, said, hey, here's your purpose. You're going to go out and do this, and now wait. Does that be frustrating to any of y'all? It's like, hey, I'm going to get you on fire. You need to go do this. Hold on, don't go do it yet. I feel like I do that to my kids all the time. I'm like, okay, kids, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to go on vacation in 40 days. And they're like, oh, dad. So oftentimes we just don't tell our kids things until like the day before it happens. They don't ask a ton of questions. But so Jesus gives this commission and he says, wait. But there's a reason for it. He wants them to wait for their helper. Now, we're going to get into the Holy Spirit a lot more next week, but the Holy Spirit is God. The Trinity, you may have heard that term before, the Trinity, it is, it is God is made up of three persons, the God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. He is our helper. And Jesus is saying, hey, when I leave, the Holy Spirit is going to come, and he's going to help you guys out with this mission that I'm giving you. So they are not alone in doing so. Kind of the main idea for the night, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you, and then we're going to continue on with the passage, is we are purposed and empowered by Jesus. We are purposed by Jesus. We are empowered by Jesus. So the disciples, Jesus, they're in Jerusalem. They have a mission. They're excited. They're ecstatic about doing it. I imagine they're pretty on fire because they're like, hey, the dude that we were following for three years, he just died. That sucks. But now he's back alive again. Oh my goodness, our faith has been restored. Like, we're on fire. Let's go do this thing. Jesus tells them to wait. Picking up in verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah means chosen one, anointed one. And so the Jews, which is what the disciples are, they're Jews, they had spent a long time waiting for this prophesied Messiah. And they expected the Messiah to be kind of a, 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 lead, like a military leader of sorts, to be a, a, a ruler, to come and restore uh, their Jewish empire, if you want to call it that, back to its proper place. Because right now they were being ruled over by Rome. And so they're like, hey, are, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so that's why they're asking, they're like, okay, Jesus, you know, you came, you were crucified, you were raised, we know you can do this. Are you doing that right now? Is it happening? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Don't you hate that? You're like, homie, I'll just ask you a simple question. Yes or no? And he's like, don't worry about it. But then, like I said, we're picking up in verse 8. Again, this is kind of the, the, the crux of the passage here, where we're going to focus on once we're done reading through it all. He says, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus says, hey, this question that you're asking about, don't worry about the answer to it. Because you don't need to know that information. You don't need to know the times or the seasons. You don't need to know when, what is going to happen. But... I am going to tell you that you will have power when the helper comes to complete your mission. And your mission is going to be not just local, but it's going to be global. Look what he says. He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So where they're at right there in all of Judea and Samaria. So the radius of, of, of their witnessing is getting larger and larger. And then he says, and in all and to the end of the earth. So, hey, you're, you're going to take my word. And you're going to make disciples here where you're at and in the next region and in the next region and eventually all over the world. And when he had said these things, after Jesus got done talking to them, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Usually when, when scripture says, Men in white robes, it's talking about angels. 
two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus gives them this commission, says, hey, don't worry about, you know, when, what is going to happen, but you have a mission to do. You're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're going to be our witnesses throughout the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends to heaven and they're just sat there like, oh my gosh, where did this dude go? He just gave us something to do and now he just left us. And then the angels are there like, yo, what are you looking at? Like, you have something to do. Like, where, where are you going? Like, get to work, guys. And we have this same mission still today. We have this same mission. We have this, the same God. The same God who commissioned them is now commissioning us. This same mission that they were given continues on generations later, centuries later to us to continue to fulfill that to take to be witnesses to the ends of the earth to the people around us but the question is how how are we to be the witnesses of Jesus well, let me tell you it doesn't start by staying here we don't start to be witnesses by staying in the church we don't we don't start being witnesses by staying in our comfort zone we don't start this by staying um, in, in our little circle of people that look like us. We don't start by surrounding ourselves with people that think, act, and believe like we do. We're to be witnesses to, to the earth, to the entire earth. Jesus was a perfect example of being in the world, but not of the world. Living here, surrounded by the people, the various, very diverse people of the world, but not having the lifestyle that they did. And that is what we are supposed to do as well. Jesus, God didn't design us to close ourselves off from the world around us and, and to live inside this little bubble. No, he says, hey, go out. So how are we going to witness to the people that we don't agree with if we're never in conversation with those people? How are we going to be witnesses to the LGBTQ plus community if we are never talking to anyone from that community? How are we going to share the love of Jesus with Democrats or Republicans or Black Lives Matter or Back the Blue or pro-life or pro-choice or anyone that we don't agree with if we're not in conversations with them? This same Jesus who is here, who was crucified for our sins, nothing of his own, crucified for our sake, this same Jesus who, after he was crucified and died, was resurrected a few days later. The same Jesus who was seen by hundreds of people after that and commissioned the disciples to go and be witnesses of him throughout the world. The same Jesus was the one who created the heavens and the earth, who created you and I, who designed us in his image. And he is the same Jesus who is here with us to help us through this, who has purposed us in this mission, who is empowering us in this journey. We are not alone. And students, as, as we continue to go through the book of Acts together, I would just encourage you to, again, think on what we opened with last week, thinking, who do you say that Jesus is? And are, are you willing to step outside your comfort zone? Are you willing to have conversations with people that you don't agree with? Are you willing to be disagreed with to have people tell you that, hey, maybe some of your thoughts are wrong? Are you willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus? He modeled it perfectly. He wasn't surrounded by, by the, the, the righteous of his day. In fact, if he had a problem with anyone in, during his lifetime, it was the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because they were supposed to be the leaders of the community at that time, and they were failing at their job. But Jesus instead surrounded himself with sinners, and he went and hung out at parties with, with drunkards, and all these people that the, that the religious leaders at the time were like, Jesus, the heck are you doing hanging out with these people? Like, you're, you're a teacher. You're a rabbi. Like, what are you doing? And Jesus was like, hey, like, I came for the sick people, not, not the people that are well and don't need healing. And so guys, like I, I, I want us to be able to, to, to take this mission and, and to go forward with it. 
and to love on the people around us, no matter what they look, act, think, believe, just to, to, to share Jesus with them, not only in, in, in the, the way that we treat them and, and loving on them, but also with our words. I hope that you would pray for opportunities to be witnesses verbally and, and, and physically in the way that you live the life and the way that you conduct yourself. And if there's anyone here that you're like, hey, like, I don't, I don't know about this whole Jesus thing. Like, I'm glad that you're here. Like, that is, that is okay. And I hope that this is a safe place for you to be able to open up, to be able to ask questions. I don't want you to be here and feel like you cannot ask questions or like you can't question what you're reading or what we're teaching. The Bible says, hey, like test everything and hold on to what is good. God gave us brains and feelings and, and thinking and thought processes for a reason. He doesn't want us just to blindly follow. He wants us to follow, but he wants us to know why we're following to be able to articulate. Let me pray for us and we'll close it out. Father God, thank you for purposing us. Thank you for empowering us. Thank you for giving us a mission and giving us a purpose and allowing us to be a part of your plan. God, you don't need us. You don't need our help. We are so unqualified. And yet you want us anyway. You love us deeply, and I pray that you would help us accept and feel and experience that love. And God, would you just stir in us a fire, a passion, a desire, a, a longing for yourself, a longing for the people around us to come to know you, to come to follow you, to come to give their life to you because giving our life to you is just, it's, it's a benefit to us. It's a benefit to the world around us because you designed us to live with you. God, we need you. Would you do a work in our lives, fathers? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, thanks, Jeremy. Guys, um, we are so excited for this series.